Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results, solutions for your behavior problems, and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Hey there, animal lovers. It's Barbara Heidenreich. It's time to talk practical application again, and we're going to talk about the ins and outs of training a sometimes very difficult behavior. We're going to talk about training an open mouth behavior. Now, what's the value of training this behavior? For most species, it has to do with checking teeth and general condition of the mouth and other structures in the mouth. But sometimes we train animals to allow us to brush their teeth, especially primates. That's a really nice one for our great apes. We can actually use it to deliver medication. So for me, I've seen some elephants that are trained to allow us to toss big giant gel caps of medication into their mouths and then they're also trained to swallow on cue. So having a nice open mouth is great for that. We can also use it for detecting temperature using infrared thermometers. And usually we're not necessarily measuring the exact temperature, but we might be looking for fluctuations in temperature. So that's what the uses of those infrared thermometers. But you can aim that that laser beam of that infrared thermometer right at a membrane in the open mouth area. And that works really well for getting a nice measurement. And if you do that consistently, you you get a nice measurement that you compare over time. We might also be collecting saliva, and if it's a bird, we might be collecting coanal samples, and also on birds, we might be trimming beaks. So there's lots of value in training this behavior. Of course, whenever you're training a new behavior, the first step is to get the action or some approximation towards your desired behavior started so that you can reinforce it and get more of this behavior. That's really how we train any behavior, of course. Then we build upon this, like trying to get more duration or maybe a wider open mouth. And then eventually we get the entire behavior the way we imagine it. The most challenging part of this behavior for most people is how to get that initial action started. And there are a number of different strategies that can work depending on the species you're training. So I want to go over a few examples of the ways that I've gotten open mouth behavior started over the years. One of my favorite ways to get this action started is to prompt the action. And there's lots of different ways to prompt the action. And that's going to vary depending on the species that you're working with. Now, a lot of you know, lately I've been working a lot with orangutans in uh, Indonesia. And with great apes, one of the things that we often do is we use chemical wash bottles to deliver juices. And when an animal is used to getting juice delivered to them from a, a, a chemical wash bottle, they'll often start to anticipate that that bottle is going to deliver juice and they'll just automatically open their mouth anticipating that juice is coming. So that can be a super easy way to get that action and then you can reinforce that. The important thing about that is that the juice bottle is just a prompt to get the action. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna transition away from that. So the the juice bottle is gonna fade out And then you're going to transition to using a hand cue to indicate that you want the animal to open the mouth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Another way to prompt the action of getting open mouth is to use some object that the animal may have an interest in engaging with to use it to open its mouth. So I often think about this when I'm working with big cats like tigers and things like that. Maybe I have a ball or some kind of enrichment item. I typically want to use something that's pretty big that the animal's going to want to put its mouth around it and I'll usually hold it outside of the mesh and you might want to even make it smelly so it's kind of interesting so the animal wants to interact with it. Typically what will happen is the animal will try to open its mouth to interact with it and the moment that you see that mouth open you can reinforce and this takes super good timing and you may ask why is that timing just so important and it's important because you want to make sure you're reinforcing opening of the mouth. What you don't want 
is biting the mesh. And especially when it comes to big cats, this is a real big problem. A lot of people inadvertently teach big cats to bite the mesh. And you may think, oh, it's not a big deal. But the reality is, is a lot of these animals can end up damaging their teeth. Same thing for bears. And so we really want to try to avoid this situation. So first of all, we don't want to reinforce it. And we also don't want to do things like leave meaty bits on the mesh where the animal might want to start engaging with that. We can also do things like using other types of reinforcers, whether it's milk or blood or delivering food items through a chute so we can avoid that situation where the animal wants to engage with the mesh. So again, it's going to take really good timing and you're also going to want to think about how you deliver your reinforcer if you're using food as a reinforcer so that you're not encouraging the animal to engage with the mesh. You're really just trying to capture that open mouth behavior and reinforce promptly and reinforce directly where you want to right inside the mouth so that you get the action that you want. Another really interesting method that I've used in the past, especially with giraffes and white rhinos in particular, is to hold the food right above the upper lip. And that typically works well, like with the white rhinos, you know, I might hold a handful of Timothy hay or something like that. With giraffes, I've held like brows right up above their upper lip. And what happens is they end up curling that lip up and it causes the mouth to open just a little bit and it gives you that opportunity to reinforce. And so, so what I mean by reinforcing in that moment is the moment that that lip curls up a little bit and you see that little bit of an opening, I drop the food down really quickly and pop it right into their mouth. And so it's really about timing of delivering the, the food reinforcers as opposed to using a bridge or anything like that. We're going to touch on that in just a little bit here. But again, I'm using the placement of the food where I position it in relation to their mouth to get an open mouth behavior and then popping that food right in there to tell them that, yep, that's what I wanted. I want that, that movement of your lips, that movement of your mouth, getting it open a little bit and then reinforcing that action. And then even just holding food in front of the animal, depending on the species again, can create that open mouth position. So again, think about things like prehensile lipped rhinos, like black rhinos and Indian rhinos. So again, if you hold food right in front of them, a lot of times they'll just open their mouth wide and then you can just pop the food right in there. Again, we don't want that to be the cue to open their mouth. So we're gonna phase that out. We're gonna, we're gonna switch from prompting with whether it's the juice bottle or holding the toy item that we were talking about that the animal might wanna bite or holding the food in front of the animal, we're gonna transition from that being the prompt to making that a hand signal or even a verbal cue. But that's, that's a little process, right? We're gonna talk about that in just a second because right now we're talking about ways up and get the action. But this is just a way to get the action started, right? So another strategy to get the action is to capture the behavior. And a great example of capturing is taking advantage of the Flemin response. The Flemin response is presented by a wide range of mammals, including ungulates and felids. And it basically involves curling the upper lip up and you kind of see the teeth and it, it just looks really bizarre, but it does cause the animal to open its mouth a little bit. So we can take advantage of it. It basically transfers pheromones across a gland in the back of the mouth. And uh, so it's kind of like a scent collection type Type of thing, but it's a very cool behavior and we can take advantage of it for when we're training open mouth behavior. And it's usually triggered by certain scents. And some of the interesting smells that might trigger it are things like urine, perfumes, sometimes the waste or the bedding from other animals at your facility, the opposite sex. We can even use synthetic pheromones. All these can trigger the Flemin response in different animal species. So all you have to do is set up the environment in which that scent is available. And often that can trigger the Flemin response. And then it's really just a simple matter of capturing the behavior. And then over time, we gradually fade out the environmental triggers that we've set up because the animal is going to start offering the behavior once it's learned that it earns reinforcers externally, right? We don't need those triggers anymore. And then we can start predicting that the animal is about to present the behavior and start inserting a cue. And next thing you know, you're getting this lovely Fleming response on cue, which is essentially an open mouth behavior. And you can shape it from there if you want to kind of change what it looks like a little bit. Another strategy I've used for training open mouth is to train the animal to put its mouth on something. Now, an object that 
is kind of cool for this is something called a speculum. And they do create this for veterinarians who need to look in the mouth of certain species. And it kind of looks like a stainless steel hanger and it has an opening in the middle. And oftentimes in the veterinary profession, it's used a little more coercively where it's kind of placed in the animal's mouth. And so it holds the animal's mouth open and the animal, and, and so the veterinarian can look inside the animal's mouth, but you can actually train an animal to place its mouth on that so that you can, you can look at the animals inside the animal's mouth and it's more of a voluntary procedure. So that's another strategy, just teaching the animal, you know, hey, put your put your mouth around this, hold it for duration, and I'll reinforce you for doing that, and it gives you the opportunity to look inside the animal's mouth. Another strategy that people talk about quite often is teaching the animal to target its upper and lower lip to an object, and in reality, that is how we kind of got that universal cue for open mouth that a lot of people are familiar with, where you start with your thumb and your forefinger together, and then you spread them apart, sort of giving that open mouth cue that many of us are familiar with. And while I see the value in that, it's certainly a method that can be used to train that behavior. In my experience, I find that one to be a little bit more challenging for a lot of animals to grasp. It's a kind of challenging concept. I have a lot more success with capturing with the Fleming response, depending on the species, or prompting the behavior using a lot of those different strategies that I mentioned already. So I got to admit that targeting upper and lower and lip, not necessarily my go-to option uh, if I'm going to train this behavior. Another one that's been mentioned out there is also literally physically manipulating the animal's mouth open. And again, not necessarily one that I've gone to in the past. Again, because typically when I'm training behaviors, I really want the animal to be thinking about what actions am I voluntarily doing that earn me reinforcers. And even though I can put an animal in a position and then give it something for allowing me to put it in that position, it isn't the animal thinking about what action am am I doing, am I producing that earns me reinforcers. So again, not one of my go-to strategies, although it's one of them that's out there and people have used it successfully, not one that I tend to gravitate towards. A lot of folks are familiar with free shaping, and this is the idea that you're not using any prompts to give the animal information as to what you would like it to do. The idea is that the animal is just going to give some approximations of behavior and you're going to bridge and reinforce. And there are some animals that are really, really savvy with this because that's been their training history. They've had a lot of experience learning that they should just offer behavior. They should just try stuff and eventually it'll earn them reinforcers. And so they really experiment a lot. And maybe you have an animal like that, that you've done a lot of training with using that technique. And if you have maybe free shaping will be a good approach for you. I will say for me, I, again, this is not a behavior that I would typically think about free shaping. I would probably go back to prompting the behavior or capturing the behavior as my go-to for getting this behavior. However, free shaping does kind of come into play a little bit when we start working on some of the other criteria, like trying to get a little bit more of a larger open mouth or a bigger open mouth or when we're starting to work a little bit on duration, right? So that does come into play a little bit. So now speaking of our other criteria, there are some things that may matter to you once you've gotten the action started. You may really need a nice big wide open mouth. You may also want duration. You may want the animal to hold that open for a nice long time. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that you don't want to work on both of those criteria at the same time, because that can be a little bit confusing for your animal. So just like when you're working with any behavior, you want to focus on mastering one of those criterion first before you start working on the other. So in general, I tend to want to focus on getting that nice wide open mouth. So getting the position I want first, getting that nice and clear and solid so the animal understands that. And then I'm going to start adding duration. 
Now let's think about some other things that you might want to work on. Maybe you want to touch the inside of the mouth, or maybe you want to add some instruments such as, can I shine a light in there? Or do I want to use one of those infrared thermometers? Maybe I need to introduce a toothbrush. And if you're using a toothbrush, maybe you're going to be adding some kind of solution or paste so that you can brush the teeth. All those are going to be steps in your shaping plan to introduce. Here's one that can really be thought provoking. Do you want to use a bridge or not? Now a bridge can be really helpful in the initial stages of capturing open mouth. That's because it may happen so fast that you really need good timing and you may not be able to deliver that reinforcer in the exact moment that the open mouth behavior occurs. So a bridging stimulus, if your animal understands it, may be a good tool for you in that circumstance. It may also be super helpful when you're trying to shape for a little bit better position. You're trying to get that bigger open mouth. So a bridge can be a great tool for that. It also can be really helpful for you when you get to the point that the animal's hope, holding the open mouth open for a long period of time and you want to teach it that, okay, you've done the job. It's time to end the duration behavior. This is the signal that means you've completed the behavior for the length of duration that I need. And now you're free to close your mouth and do something else. But this is something that needs to be taught. And this is different than the bridge that you were using when you were just saying, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. And here comes your reinforcer for capturing those little moments when you're getting a little bit bigger or you just open the mouth. And that's the really cool, interesting thing about a bridging stimulus. It can mean so many different things. So that's why I say it has to be taught. One of the things I often see when people are working on duration is because the animal has learned in the initial stages when they first hear that bridge that ah, they've done it correctly and I should just quickly turn and get my reinforcer, um, you'll often see they get a very quick open and they'll get that bridge and the behavior is done. And the trainers have a really hard time getting past that. So they end up sort of getting into this situation where they have an animal that opens its mouth and then they close it again and then they open it again and then they close it again. And they have a really tough time getting duration. So how do you get past that? Well, one of the things that can really help with that is to kind of get away from the bridge for a little while in this, in this stage. Just don't worry about it at this stage of the game. What you're going to focus on is building duration. And what's going to help you is just the delivery of your reinforcer. So remember, a bridge is just a tool to help you under certain circumstances, but your real power tool is always going to be your reinforcer. So what we're going to do is you're going to be really, really prepared to deliver that reinforcer quickly. And when you're working on trying to get a little bit of duration, once that animal opens its mouth and you're gonna kind of count in your head and let's say you get a split second longer than you got before, you're just gonna deliver the reinforcer as fast as you possibly can. You're not even gonna worry about a bridging stimulus. And then you're going to go for your next approximation. You're going to see if, you know, that animal might be, you might be at the stage where you haven't inserted a cue yet. The animal may just be offering, and we'll talk about inserting cues in a second here. The animal's offering that open mouth, and you're going to count in your head, and maybe you get one, two seconds, and then you're going to deliver that reinforcer as fast as you possibly can. And then you're gonna count for one, two, three seconds and try and deliver that reinforcer as fast as you can. So instead of expecting your bridge to do the work as the reinforcer, be prepared to deliver your reinforcer quickly before the animal closes its mouth so you don't get into that situation where it's open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close, but you're actually building little increments of time that teach the animal, oh, I should hold it a little longer, a little longer, a little longer in order to get that reinforcer. And as you start to get that duration going, and so now you're getting some good significant duration, then you can start introducing your bridge again. And then the animal can start learning to wait until it hears the bridging stimulus to end the duration, and then you can deliver the reinforcer after the bridge. I find that really helps in those initial stages as, as you're trying to build duration. All right, let's go back to talking about inserting a cue. So it's gonna be a little different depending on the strategy that you used. So if you captured the behavior, right? So that means if the animal, like so let's say it was a phlegm in response kind of thing, if you captured the behavior, 
the animal's going to learn that when I just presented that behavior, I earned reinforcers. So the animal's going to just start offering the behavior over time. And when you see that the animal just starts offering it, you're going to know that that's your signal, that it's time to start predicting when the animal's about to present the behavior. And you're going to try to predict and you're going to try to insert your cue right before you think the animal's about to present the, the behavior. And that's how the cue is going to get significance. It's going to be paired with the action followed by the reinforcer. And then you're going to start trying not to reinforce when the animal just offers. You're only going to reinforce when the animal presents a behavior after you present the cue. So that's your one strategy for inserting the cue. If you used a prompt, your strategy is going to be a little bit different, right? In that situation, you're going to try to fade out the prompt and transition to using your cue. A nice example for me is using that chemical wash bottle to train a great ape to open its mouth. So a lot of times they'll see that that chemical wash bottle and that mouth will open right away. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll hold up the wash bottle and I'll kind of pause. And when the mouth opens, then I'll wait a little bit so that the mouth is open for a little bit and then I'll deliver you know, the juice that's in the bottle, right? And then what I start to do is I start to hold that juice bottle a little bit farther away so it's not quite so close to the animal. And then I'll transition to having a hand signal nearby. And then the juice bottle tends to be held farther back and the hand signal tends to be held closer to the animal. And the next thing you know, the juice bottle is being held lower and lower and the hand signal is being held closer and closer to the animal. It's this very kind of smooth, but I want to say slow, but it's not really slow. It's kind of a quick but smooth transition to, hey, let's pr- replace that juice bottle as the prompt with my hand signal. And it, and it's, it just happens very sort of organically. I don't even know how, how else to describe it for you. But very quickly, the animal will figure out that, ah, and if your timing is good, that now the hand signal means I should open my mouth and the juice bottle doesn't even need to be there. And what will happen is the juice bottle will end up being behind your back. You'll give the hand cue, the animal will open its mouth for as long as your hand is up there um, and open. And then as soon as you feel like the animal has met criteria, your hand goes away and the juice bottle appears to reinforce the behavior. So it's a little different whether it's captured or prompted, but it's just a matter of transitioning with the prompt, transitioning from the prompt to the hand cue. And if it's captured, it's about inserting that cue prior to the animal offering the behavior. So there you go. All right. So there is a lot of information about how to train open mouth. I'm sure there's a lot more we could discuss too, but I just wanted to give you some tidbits to help get you started. And here's some things for your training toolbox so that you can try this week if you wanna train an open mouth behavior. First of all, brainstorm how you might create the initial action of open mouth with the species you train so that you can reinforce that first action of opening the mouth. And then focus on training one criterion at a time, whether that's going to be open wider or holding for duration. And then once you've mastered that one criterion, then you focus on the next one. And then you're going to put the behavior on cue, whether that's by fading out the prompt or inserting the cue when the behavior is offered frequently. It all depends on how you train the behavior in the first place, right? All right, I hope you enjoyed these training tips. You want more? For just $1, you get 10 days of full access to animaltrainingfundamentals.com. Just pick a membership, enter the code TRY10DAYS, and check it out. Thanks for talking training with me, and I hope you will join me next time when we'll talk about some more great practical application tips. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family.